some writer. We are on chapter three. And it starts with a quote. I took to writing early to assuage my uneasiness and collect my thoughts. And I was a busy writer long before I went into long pants. So he wrote to make himself feel better if he was upset or uneasy. And he says he was already a writer by the time he was basically in high school. I mean, he wore knickers, those short pants that we talked about when you were younger. And then he wore long pants. And the other thing is, his name is Elwin, but they do go back and forth between calling him Elwin and calling him N, which was his family nickname. One by one, N's brothers and sisters left their home in New York. Al and Stan graduated from Cornell University. Lillian attended Vassar College, and his other sisters married and had children. At five years old, N was already an uncle. Elwin could canoe, ice skate, play adia on piano, and ride his bike backwards while sitting on the handlebars. But girls terrified him. He also liked to write poems, stories, and letters to his siblings, sometimes signing his letter Sir Elwin White or Buttercup. When he was nine, Anne sent a poem to Albert, his brother at Cornell, and a few months later, Anne submitted it to Woman's Home Companion Contest and won his first literary prize. Literary means like writing, anything about books or writing, so he won a prize for his writing when he was nine, and this is a magazine. Okay, so let's see what, this is a story of a little mouse by Elwin White. Once there was a wise little mouse, at least that's what he thought, but this experience shows you what his wisdom brought, just what his wisdom brought. One day, as he walked through the kitchen, a wire box he spied, and in it was a hunk of cheese, which he very carefully eyed. Then he decided he'd have some, so in the box he stepped. Farther and farther, very cautiously he crept. Farther and farther and farther, three farthers, very cautiously crept. But all of a sudden, the trap sprang and cut right off his head, for the cruel trap had been laid for him, and there he lay, quite dead. As a lesson for a little mouse, I certainly advise that mice had better be careful and try not to be too wise. That's pretty good. He was nine when he wrote that. Wow. And began sending his stories to St. Nicholas, a monthly magazine for young readers. One of the magazine's most popular features was the St. Nicholas League Contest, held for the best stories, essays, poems, drawings, and snapshots, and puzzles. If a piece was published, the artist would win a gold or a silver badge. Anyone could join the league. Other budding writers, Edna St. Vincent Millay, William Faulkner, Adora Weltley, and Rachel Carson, were members. So these people all become famous writers also. Rachel Carson was a big environmentalist. You'll probably read a book by her in middle school. Faulkner was a very famous writer. So let's see. Um, and later described the league members as an industrious and fiendishly competitive band of tots. Very competitive young kids, basically. A neighborhood friend, E. Barrett Brady, pointed out that the stories that won prizes were often about being kind to animals. All of his life, Anne had been kind to animals. He had tended to pigeons, dogs, snakes, pollywogs, turtles, rabbits, lizards, singing birds, chameleons, caterpillars, and mice. So it wasn't hard for him to write a story about animals. When he wrote A Winter Walk about a dog and woodland animals, it won a silver badge from St. Nicholas. A few years later, a true dog story about his dog Beppo won the coveted gold medal. And here's a picture of the magazine. And here is his story. It says a few years before N wrote True Dog Story, he had a word puzzle published in St. Nicholas to find the answers to his crossword enigma. Turn to page 159. So he had a puzzle written. What I'll do is post that puzzle and the answers so you guys can try to do it. But then this is the story that won the prize. Okay. A True Dog Story by Elwin White, age 14. And he's writing about his dog, Beppo. <clears throat> he 
He is a large Irish setter with a beautiful red coat and a lovable disposition. One summer, when we were in Maine, father and my two brothers went for a walk, taking Beppo the dog with them. Coming to what seemed to be a large pasture slope, they climbed over the stone wall and walked up the hill. Just as they reached the summit so they could see beyond, they were confronted by a large herd of steers. Those are big, powerful cows. On seeing them, the animals advanced menacingly. The trio started back to the wall with Beppo in leash, but found to their horror that the steers were chasing them. It would be impossible to reach the wall by running. There seemed to be but one way, the dog. On the farm, Beppo had been taught to bring in cows by going around and back of them and chasing them on. The folks realized that if he did that now, it could be fatal. And yet they must act quickly. And they must act and act quickly, for the big animals were rapidly coming upon them. Again, they looked at the wall. It seemed a quarter of a mile away. There was but one thing to do. Setting the dog loose, my brother cried, Hold him, Bep, hold him. Simultaneously, the dog bounded toward the herd, and the three made for the wall. For about 200 yards, they ran as they never run, had never run before. Then, looking over their shoulders, they saw the whole herd standing on the brow of the hill with a little ball of red racing madly up and down in front of them. In a minute, the little party was safely over the wall, and Beppo, the hero, came barking down the hill. What a great story. In high school, Ann began writing for the Oracle, his school newspaper. But the best part of high school, he said, was getting to and fro, which was on my bicycle. Girls may have noticed him, but he didn't have the nerve to ask them out. Ann was still in high school when World War I broke out. He had his heart set on going to Cornell University, just like his brothers, and was accepted and awarded scholarships that more than covered the $100 a year tuition. Still, in 1917, the summer before Edwin Elwin went to college, he wrote in his journal, May 27th, I don't know what to do this summer. The country is at war, and I think I ought to serve. July 5th, my utter dependence calls me, and I am living the life of a slacker. But Elwin didn't weigh enough to join the Army. Finally, he joined the cadets and worked on a farm for the summer. Even though he was about to leave for Cornell in the fall, his journal entry on his birthday was no more enthusiastic. July 11th, 18 and still no future. I'd be more contented in prison, for there at least I would know precisely what I had to look forward to. So it's at this age, even though he got into Cornell, um, there's a war on and he thinks he should go fight. Um, he thinks a, a slacker means you're like lazy and he doesn't know what his future is going to be. So he, he wants some direction. He doesn't know what he's going to do yet. I didn't care for athletics, being skinny and small, but I liked ice ponds and skating on a winter on winter afternoons and evenings, I would visit a pond, a 15 minute ride on a trolley car and skate with a girl named Mildred Hess. Together, we would have covered hundreds of miles, sometimes leaving the pond proper and gliding into the woods on narrow fingers of ice. We didn't talk much, never embraced. We just skated for the ecstasy of skating, a magical glide. This brief interlude on ice had a dreamlike quality, a purity, that has stayed with me all my life. And when nowadays I see a winter sky and feel the wind dropping with the sun and the naked trees against a redding west, I remember what it was like to be in love before any of love's complexities or realities or disturbances had entered in, to dilute in splendor and challenge its perfection. So he's talking about basically his first love and how easy it was to be free and happy and ice skating before it got complicated. Because love, then if you grow up and get married and have kids and buy a house and get a job and all that, um, love becomes part of all of that. But this first love, when he's young and ice skating and free, he's so happy. 
Alwyn arrived at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, a few days before classes started. He checked into a hotel to wait, and in his enthusiasm, he became so engrossed in what was going on in town. The trolleys, the walking paths, Lake Cayuga. The days went by before he realized classes had begun. Elwin liked Cornell. His classmates nicknamed him Andy, after Cornell's first president, Andrew Dickinson White. So he had the same last name as the president, so they nicknamed him Andy. From then on, to friends and family, Elwin White was Andy White. His professors became part of his social life. So that means that they weren't just his teachers, they became sort of like his friends. Students met at Professor Adams' house for cocoa and chess. Andy joined Professor Sampson's manuscript club. From Professor Strunk, Strunk, he learned to omit needless words. That means like get rid of. So when you're writing, don't involve a lot of words, just use the words you need. And he fell in love with Henry David Thoreau's Walden. So this is a famous writer, Henry David Thoreau, who went and lived in the woods for like two years, just in total isolation in this beautiful area and wrote a book called Walden. Andy began writing for the school newspaper, The Cornell Sun, which he found much more interesting than studying. He got a D in English his first semester. When he became editor of The Sun, it took so much of his time, he was excused from English class. He wrote his mother, this morning news came of my utter redemption from my deepest gloom, which is merely to say, I don't have to write so much stuff every day. So he gets to go be on the newspaper, and that's one of his professors. This guy actually wrote a really um, famous book that you'll probably have in college. People still use it. It's all about, like, the rules of grammar and how to write well. Um, so he was influenced by him. Here's a picture of him swinging on a branch. And there he is in college. So he doesn't have to take class, English class now, he, because he's the editor. One year, Andy took a class in medieval history. The professor, George Lincoln Burr, taught him in such a way that Andy was transported back centuries so he could imagine what it was like to live in medieval times like kings and queens and castles. He learned that when tyrants reign, that's like people who take a lot of power and don't give the people freedom or choice, Societies sacrifice freedom. In Andy's senior year, it was Burr who stood up for a Cornell student who was being bullied into wearing a freshman cap, a tradition upperclassmen had come up with for all freshmen. So this is the professor who influenced him. And this is what they did. They made the freshman, which is the youngest class, wear this hat with their name on it, just to sort of tease them and bully them. Um, so in Andy's senior year, it was Burr who stood up for a Cornell student who was being bullied into wearing it. The student had refused to wear it and the campus was in an uproar. But Burr observed, a matter of garb seems to be a small thing to fight about. What chance for discussion? What room for protest? There is no safety valve so precious to civil order as legitimate freedom of that speech. So he's saying like, this boy has the right to like fight use his words freedom of speech means to protest using your words and so that motivated andy andy said that meeting burr was the single greatest thing that ever happened in his life burr introduced andy to a part of himself he had not yet discovered andy saw with blinding clarity how important it was to live with freedom to express your ideas to be free andy later wrote, wrote later is to feel you belong to the earth. For the first time, Andy had a focus for his thoughts, for his principles. He began to consider writing for a living. So now he's motivated. He knows what to write about. He wants to write about freedom and freedom of speech and how important that is. And I know it's confusing because now they're calling him Andy. So his name is Elwin. His nickname growing up was N. When he got to college, people nicknamed him Andy. So that's all the same person. After graduation, Andy took a job as a counselor at Camp Otter in Canada. A classmate from Cornell, Howard Cushman, went too. 
Neither wanted to rush into a job in an office. Maybe they would go out west for a while. What was the hurry to have a regular job? Here they are. Counselors. And that's him in the middle. Okay, chapter four is called From Sea to Shining Sea. A person who is looking for something doesn't travel very fast. When he returned home from camp, Andy had a series of writing jobs that he disliked. He and Cush made plans to go west. Andy bought a Model T Roadster for about $400 and named it Hot Spur. He and Cush organized camping gear and packed their clothes, a cigar box, fiddle, two Corona typewriters, and a Webster's Dictionary. To remind them, their true destination was the world of letters. Andy said nothing about this trip to his parents. The night before they were ready to leave, Cush joined Andy at the White's house for dinner. At the supper table, Andy announced that they were heading out west in the morning, leaving no time for his parents to talk him out of the trip. Andy and Cush had no real plan except to go west and pay their way by writing as they went along. They were in no hurry. In 1922, the roads that crossed America were sometimes just paths through fields. Signs were often arrows made from old shingles. They deliberately didn't even pack a road map. Like Thoreau, still a favorite author of Andy's, they were traveling light and trying new adventures. So the Thoreau's the one who went into the woods and lived for two years. The Model T was not a fussy car. It sprang cheerfully toward any stretch of wasteland, whether there was a noticeable road underfoot or not. The course of my life was changed by it, and it is in a class by itself. It was cheap enough so I could afford to buy one. It was capable enough, so it gave me courage to start. So basically they're going to drive cross country. They have no real plan, just an adventure in this car that he just bought and they're bringing their typewriter. Oh, so here's a map of the United States. And this is where he starts from New York, Mount Vernon in March of 1922. And this is where they go. Minneapolis Journal Limerick Contest. Notes. Okay, it looks like he might have submitted a limerick. A young man who liked to rock boats in order to get people's goats just gave one more rock, then suffered a shock. A bubble the spot now denotes. <laughs> so that's his limerick that he wrote. And then they went all the way up here, all the way up to Canada. There's Cush and Andy, and they arrived in Seattle in October. So they left in March, and they traveled March, April, May, June, July, September. October they arrived. Now, if ever, is the time to bum it about a bit. So here we go, jogging leisurely from one free meal to the next, taking a general westerly direction, writing a lot, selling a little maybe, and chopping proverbial wood to eke out a supper. And here's the route. He sold a sonnet that's like kind of a poem for $5 about a horse that won the Kentucky Derby. He, in the Limerick contest, he only wrote the last line and he won $25. He played piano in a cafe in exchange for meals. He walked 32 miles with Cush's typewriter, trading it for a new tire for $7 for Hotspur, this is the name of his car. He sandpapered a dance floor and earned $3. He picked pears in an orchard for $30 per hour, 10 hours a day. Wow, but that's a good amount of money. That afternoon, we washed, we washed dirt from ourselves in our clothes in 10 Mile Lake and slept there in a little pine grove. There they are, so they have their typewriter, they have their cigar box, their dictionary, their car. Andy White, then he is, works for the Seattle Times, so let's find about that. 
When they arrived in Seattle six months later, Andy wrote that he had left a track across the United States as erratic as a mouse's track in snow. Erratic means it doesn't have like a straight path. It doesn't have any like real um, plan. It just kind of goes up and down and around. <clears throat> he found a job as a reporter with the Seattle Times. Cush headed back home. As a reporter, Andy hated to be told what to write, but he liked his boss. When Andy asked how to describe a story, his boss thought for a moment and then said, just say the words. It was sound advice that Andy remembered all his life. So that's the advice, just say the words. And here he is. And he says, as a reporter and later a columnist, he earned $40 per week, but he discovered he would never make a good newspaper reporter. I was not quick enough or alert enough. I was always taking the wrong train in the wrong direction. So it wasn't exactly the kind of writing he wanted to do. And he didn't feel like he was good at it. All right, last page. We like to write more like poems and stories. Ah, uh, the New Yorker magazine, still very famous, still in print. The Seattle Times gave him a chance to write a small personal pieces, but eventually Andy was laid off. That was fine with him. He preferred to be footloose. Andy took a ship to Alaska and Siberia before heading home. On returning to New York, he lived with his parents and commuted to a new job in advertising in Manhattan. Andy still sent out his light verses, sonnets, and squibs to magazines, mostly for no pay, just for the sheer glory of sometimes seeing his writing in print. At night on Long Island Sound, he sailed his canoe rigged with sails made of bed sheets. Then a friend told him about a brand new magazine that might like Andy's sense of humor. In February of 1925, Andy swung into the Grand Central Terminal. So he's taking a train into New York. And when you take a train to New York City, you land at Grand City, Grand Central. He laid 15 cents on the line and bought the very first issue of The New Yorker. Nine weeks later, the new magazine published a piece by E.B. White. And this is going to be a turning point in his career because that's an important magazine. It's a great magazine. See if your family has it. Ask your parents about that one. Okay, I'm going to stop there for today.